Want to make your combat more tactical and exciting? In this video, I got my top 10 homebrew house rules for combat. Welcome to the Dungeon Coach. I'm the Dungeon Coach. I'm going to help you lower that DC in your game while elevating your combat. Now your DM is going to have to approve any of these rules to be able to bring them to your table. But players, bring whichever one of these rules you like to your DM and see if they're cool with it. I am a huge fan of homebrew. Dungeons & Dragons is one of the only games I know of that in their core rulebook literally says it's all optional. Just use it as a recommendation. I run an entirely homebrewed campaign with custom classes, races, the works. I really do love 5th edition and I think they do a great job of having a foundation that covers almost everything. But over the years there's just been times where you get that feeling and things just feel off. So these 10 rules are what I've come up with to solve that problem. And stick around to the end of the video where I go over how I handle two of the most overpowered feats, Greater Weapon Master and Sharpshooter. But let's lay some ground rules on how these homebrew rules work. I don't use all of these for every game that I ever play. This should really be a group decision of what your players want to play with. Pick and choose from this list what you like. And if you don't like something, comment down below and we can tweak it or come up with something new for you. And if you like a method that you use better, that's great too. I want to hear it. I want to create a dungeon crew that shares their ideas with each other and come up with creative solutions to each other's problems. Whenever I homebrew, I try and use the current system as a foundation whenever I can. Here's what I mean. There's already a mechanic in the rulebook called cover. If you have half or partial cover, plus two armor class. Three fourths cover, plus five armor class. This makes sense. If you have something beneficial, it gives you plus two. If you have even more of it, it gives you plus five. Now remember that mechanic when I talk about my first rule. Number one, advantage and disadvantage stacking. Currently in the rulebook, if you have multiple things that grant you advantage, it all washes away and you can only ever have one advantage. Here's an example of where this feels bad to me. You and your party are fighting a tough enemy. You're the barbarian, but you're last in initiative. The Battlemaster fighter rushes in and trip attacks, knocking him prone, giving advantage on any melee attacks. The cleric of the group casts Guiding Bolt. Now yes, I know the cleric would have disadvantage on his ranged spell attack roll, but we're not talking about the cleric. And the Guiding Bolt hits, granting advantage on the next attack on the target. And now the ranger spends their entire turn taking the help action and describes a super cool way that they help you in combat, giving you advantage on your next attack. And now it's your turn, Barbarian. You run in there and you use Reckless Attack, which gives you advantage on all of your swings. Now stop. Most none of that matters because advantages don't stack, so you only roll once with advantage. All that cool combo that the entire team just put together to make this thing happen doesn't count. Now that feels bad to me. Now this is obviously a rare occurrence with four things granting advantage, but there's a lot of times that two will. And I agree that rolling an extra d20 every single time would be too powerful. So here's how I handle it. Multiple advantages stack in the same way as cover. So if something grants another advantage, it doesn't get wasted, it gets converted into a simple plus at the end of the roll. So when you make a roll and something gives you advantage, now you have advantage. And if something were to give you another advantage, instead it becomes plus two. So now you have advantage plus two. And if you get another advantage, now it becomes advantage plus five. Another one on top of that, advantage plus 10. And if you think granting advantage plus 10 is too much, it takes a lot of creative thinking and team collaboration to pull this thing off, which is one of my favorite things about this. Just having this rule out there lets the players think about these awesome combos they can do. And keep in mind, this is also true for disadvantage. So if you're exhausted and poisoned, I think that would be worse than just a normal disadvantage. So that would be disadvantage minus two. Number two, flanking. In the player's handbook, the default rules say there is no flanking. But that doesn't make sense to me because I do feel it would be advantageous to flank somebody from behind. But I also think it's too strong to grant full advantage for doing that. So I stick with that same system of plus two for something good and plus five for even more. So here's how I handle it. If an enemy is engaged with one of your party members and you approach from behind to flank, you get plus two to your roll. And if another ally runs in and you're both flanking, now you both get plus five. Now enemies won't just leave their backs to you and get wailed on, so here's how it works. Level five barbarian runs in, makes his attack. He gets plus two to his attack roll because he's flanking. As soon as he hits though, this creature can turn around and face him. But now this would grant him plus two on his roll. Another ally runs in and hits him, he can turn to face him after he gets hit. Now if you instead use gems for your combat, this can be a little harder. So if you're enemies, you can put little stickers on here if you want, so it shows which way they face. This should make the concept of getting surrounded much more terrifying. And if you do use this rule, I've also created magic items in my game of a shield that prevents this bonus from being added. 
and you become unflankable. Number three, a targeted attack. Now there's nothing in the rule book on this, but a lot of times when a player describes where they attack a creature, it's just for flavor and nothing really happens. So players at my table would say really cool stuff and then nothing would really happen. And that felt bad. So here's how this rule works. Any player can target a specific spot on an enemy for a bonus effect, but they have to make that roll at disadvantage. They still roll for damage if they hit, but they also get a bonus effect. This is something you'll have to make up on the fly and require some quick thinking, but usually it makes sense what the call should be. They aim for a leg or a wing, they go for their eye or something in their hand. So if they hit, maybe now the target has reduced movement speed, it can't fly, it's blind, or they drop whatever they were holding in their hand. Now, you don't have to make this too strong. Have that effect only last for a round or so. Or another thing I do is put a damage threshold on there of some kind, and that effect doesn't trigger until they've done a certain amount of damage to that specific spot. A player wants to stop an enemy from flying away, so they specifically target the wings. And once a certain amount of damage is dealt, now they can't fly for a round. And if they keep going, maybe now their wing chops off. So whenever this happens, I keep track of the monster's main health, because this damage still affects it. But I also keep track of the specific target on the side. And if what they're trying to do is game breaking to your encounter, you can always add armor class to that specific location as well. So they're attacking with disadvantage at a higher armor class, it's gonna be a lot harder. Just having this mechanic at your table can lead to some pretty cool monsters that I've created. I threw a huge construct to my players that had a large crystal on its chest. And then when they were attacking it, they couldn't deal any damage. But then one player figured out, if you specifically hit the crystal, that's the only way to hurt it. And once they dealt enough damage to it, the whole thing collapsed. And my players have also surprised me with my own rule. They were fighting a manticore one time that had a really devastating poison tail attack. They started specifically targeting attacks towards its tail as it span around to defend itself and eventually chopped the thing off and it couldn't use it anymore. So this rule really lets your players get creative. Number four, opportunity attacks. An opportunity attack is when you spend your reaction to be able to make a swing at an opponent that leaves your melee range. I feel like these are too widely used sometimes and just don't make sense, and they become too mindless. Here's what I mean. If you have a hulking creature that can barely move and it swings really slow, it shouldn't be able to have an opportunity attack. Which would lead to some cool mechanics of players running in, hitting it, and getting out. Or if a smaller creature is surrounded by enemies on all sides and one of those enemies leaves, if they were completely surrounded in combat, they wouldn't have the freedom to just take a swing. And if they did, I'd say that they get free swings too. The big picture here is this rule is to stop opportunity attacks from being so automatic pilot. And if every single thing can do them, then it becomes way too robotic and not as dynamic. So how I do this for players is only martial classes get opportunity attacks. And if you're a ranger with a bow, no, you don't get one either. Unless you wanna swing with a bow and maybe break it. This is also how Pathfinder does it. And there's a really cool video I want to make about taking Pathfinder rules and modifying them for D&D 5th edition. So I want my players to think about opportunity attacks and what things could be done to affect them. A party member is about to die to an enemy, two of their friends rush in, overwhelm the enemy, and let them run away. And I've thrown a boss at my players before that was really fast and had multiple arms. It had multiple opportunity attacks. Number five, a new prone mechanic. If you fall prone in combat, you spend half your movement speed to get up. Now time out. Before I get into the fancy new prone mechanic, here's how I run standing up from prone. Instead of half your movement speed, I just have it cost 15 movement speed always. Because it doesn't make sense to me for a barbarian with long strider that has 50 feet of movement speed and is really quick to have to spend 25 feet of movement to stand up instead of 15. He would stand up super quick and then run. So back to the new prone mechanic. So in the rule book, if you fall prone in combat, you have to spend half your movement speed to stand up, and that's it. Now, I think it should be really bad if you fall on your back or on your face in the middle of combat. And yes, like we said before, enemies in melee range do have advantage on their attack rolls, but ranged attacks have disadvantage against you. So I feel like it should be more scary than this. So here's how I run it. If you fall prone in combat, it costs 15 feet of movement to stand up, but it also costs your reaction. And the act of standing up provokes opportunity attacks from everyone around you. So anyone in melee range gets a free swing. Because again, it should be a bad scenario if you're prone, surrounded by enemies. This can put your players in some scary situations they're gonna have to scramble and maybe use the dodge action or disengage. But it also makes your players more excited when they have their own mechanics or magic items you give them that cause enemies to be prone. In general, I always felt that the prone mechanic was underwhelming. So I feel like this mechanic puts it where it needs to be. And if you haven't seen the big picture by now, a lot of these rules are intertwined. I wanna create combat that's both rewarding and punishing to people who think tactically and uses it to their advantage. Huh, advantage? See what I did there? Huh? Number six, a new help action. In D&D, the most action that players ever do is take the attack action. 
and you or cast spells. And this is fine because that is what combat's all about, but I want to spice things up. So here's how this boosted help action works. So when you take the help action to help another player, instead of granting them advantage, it grants them 1d10 that they add to the roll. Outside of combat, this works just like Bardic Inspiration. And I also think it's really cool when you can numerically see how much that player really helped. Is it a 1 or a 10? So this rule was pretty cool, but my players never really used it in combat. So I stepped it up a notch. So if they take the help action in combat, they still get to roll that same d10 towards their attack roll, but they also add this to their damage. You only roll once and add the same number to both. So if it's a 3, you add plus 3 to the attack roll, and if they hit, plus 3 to the damage. I feel like if a player takes their entire turn in combat to help a player, there should be some sort of damage incentive as well. Now I think this is pretty cool, and my goal here is to entice players to work together. Now I still don't think this rule is where I want it to be, and I still want to tweak it some more. So I'm asking you guys down in the comments, what would you do to help me help you help the help action? Number seven, the interaction. On their turn, every player can make a skill check for free. Now this doesn't always happen, but I want this to be on the table for players to be able to interact with the world around them. Or I want them to think outside the box to do some really cool stuff and not be afraid to lose their action or bonus action to do it. Now there's an exception to this I'll say at the end. So in the middle of combat, if the player wants to look around and see if there's anybody following them, they can make a perception check. And maybe they see something. This is also similar when a player wants to say something on their turn. As long as it doesn't take too long, they can say whatever they want for free. But if they say something really impactful, have them make a roll for it and see if they can change the battlefield. Now depending on what they're going for and the effect of what a success would cause, this roll could cost them their action or bonus action, but I make sure to let them know that beforehand if it's something really big. Now here's an important part. If they agree to make that roll and they fail, then it costs them nothing. So an example, if a player wants to flip a large table over on top of some small enemies and pin them down to the ground, I'd say, okay, make a strength check, and if this works, it'll cost you your action and they'll be pinned underneath the table. So if a player rolls that strength check and fails, they don't lose anything except the free roll I give them. They would still have their action and bonus action. I run it this way because I want my players to engage with my world in unique and creative ways and not just get stuck on automatic pilot of attacking every round. Now what I will say is if a player describes something with huge risk and has huge reward, I'll say you could use your action or maybe even your whole turn for this, but it could be amazing. Number eight, massive critical damage. In the player's handbook, whenever you get a crit on an attack, all you do is double the dice. But nothing feels worse when you land a critical strike, but then it just did less damage than the hit you did before. So I wanted to look for a rule that had consistently high criticals. I feel like every critical strike should be a big hit because it's a critical strike. One of my own players actually showed me this rule. So players, don't be afraid to pitch your DM all the different rules you like. Here's how it works. Let's say you normally roll 1d8 plus five for your damage. So if you crit, that would be 2d8s. But if you roll ones on both of them, now you'd only have two damage plus five is seven. It doesn't really feel like a critical. So if we use that same 1d8 plus five attack and you crit, you still double the dice and have two d8s now, but the extra dice you get, you don't roll. You leave them maxed and you roll the others. So now that could have been two ones. We have an eight plus one is nine plus that five, 14. Leaving the extra dice maxed out guarantees we'll have a big crit. This way, whenever you roll that natural 20, it'll always feel like a critical strike. Now there's three things with this rule that can get a little out of hand. Rogues, paladins, and spells. My thoughts on this is for rogues, it's totally fine. Big criticals are a central part of their class fantasy. Now for paladins and their smites, if you don't want them to do so much damage, you can make them declare their smites before they find out if they got a critical or not. This way they can't wait around for a critical and then unload some crazy damage. And in general, I feel like that just makes more sense to cast smite and then swing. The last thing here are spells. And if you let your players double the dice on spells, that can lead to some crazy numbers. But if you don't let them do this, it's gonna feel real bad for them when those martial classes are getting a bunch of cool criticals and they don't. So if you want a third option here, I base this mechanic off of one that's already in the game. Whenever a player gets a critical on a spell, let them re-roll any of the dice they want. This will lead to a much higher average and more consistent big criticals. Number nine, movement. The current rules of movement is every square you move is five feet. But if you start moving at a diagonal, it's five feet of movement, then 10, then back to five, then back to 10. Now, yes, this is mathematically accurate, and there are times when you want your rules to be very accurate. But when a rule causes the game to slow down and confuse the crap out of new players, and even players that play regularly, that's a problem. So this rule is the most simple rule of all. All movement is just five feet in any direction. 
Ever since I switched to this, all those times where multiple players are trying to help somebody count by alternating fives and tens are no more. There's no more hiccups to combat, and it's so much more smooth and enjoyable. Number 10, the bloodied condition. At my table, I don't let my players say their exact hit point totals in the middle of combat. Instead, they're only allowed to describe themselves in one of three conditions. If a player's at half health, they would describe themselves as bloodied. If they're at 25% health, it's well bloodied, and 10% health is on death's door. How am I looking? Oh, I have 17 health. To a character, what does 17 even mean? They would have no idea an exact hit point total in combat, but they would be able to look over at an ally and tell about how bloodied they are. Now this also works the same for enemies. As the DM, when a monster's been wounded and worn down to about half health, I describe them as well bloodied. But if they were fighting a skeleton, would that be well broken or well boned? I feel like this provides a better feel for your players in combat of where everyone's health's at. And now for that bonus tip. These two feats, along with Lucky, are guarded to some of the best feats in the game and can get a little broken. Greater Weapon Master and Sharpshooter are feats that allow a player to reduce their attack roll by 5 in order to gain double that or 10 to their damage. Now for low and even mid-level characters, this damage can be broken. Plus 10 is sometimes double damage. So this is the solution I found on Reddit that I want to share with you guys. Instead of always subtracting 5 and adding 10, instead you use your proficiency bonus. So whatever your proficiency bonus is, you subtract that from the attack roll and you double that for the damage. So at first when your proficiency bonus is only plus 2, you subtract 2 from the roll, but you add double that or 4 to the damage. And at level 5 your proficiency bonus is 3, so you'd subtract 3 and add 6 to your damage. And if you're level 17, and your proficiency bonus is plus 6, you subtract 6 from your roll and add 12 to your damage. I feel like this is a brilliant solution and puts it in a perfect spot in my opinion. There it is, 10 homebrew house rules to make your combat more tactical and exciting. I hope these sparked your creativity and maybe you bring some of these to your game. These videos are for both the DMs and players, so share them with each other and comment down below if there's some stuff you want help with for parts of your game that just feel a little off. We can come up with something here together in the Dungeon Crew. And I promise I'll reply to every single comment because I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. And I want to know what you guys want to see. And like I said in my last video, if this video gets 100 likes, I'll know you like this homebrew stuff. And I'll make another video on all the homebrew things I use that don't have to do with combat. I have a ton of stuff on homebrewing. In fact, in next week's video, I'm really excited to share with you guys a homebrew method I use that I've never heard anybody else talk about before. It's a brand new way to customize your D&D character's class and abilities as they level up. This really lets you fulfill the vision you have for your character and gives you something that's truly unique. So stay tuned because I post new videos every Saturday at noon. So if you like this homebrew stuff, click that like button. And if you like what you see here and you want to join the dungeon crew, hit that subscribe button and turn on that notification bell so you don't miss out. And until then, I'll catch y'all next time. Peace.